Um, what I'd like to try and talk to you about is more a sort of case study of the repository experience we've had at the University of Hull in terms of how we've seen the development of our repository for the university uh, and describe also the workings of the community that we've become part of around the repository development uh, that we've taken forward, which is called Hydra. You just see the head there. Um, so, just a bit of background to the University of Hull and our take on a repository, uh, which is that we figured that an institutional repository means that for one institution you have one repository. And that repository can then be used to manage whatever digital content is needs to be managed. And the reasons we took, I mean, the reasons, some of the reasons we went down that line or came to that conclusion was that we felt that if repositories are going to be taken seriously further down the line, they have to be considered as infrastructure, not just a service, not just a, another piece of software, but they have to be considered as infrastructure. We're talking about the serious management of digital content the digital outputs of the major research and teaching institutions of this country. Therefore, we've got to take it seriously. And in order to justify that and make it infrastructure, we had to be able to justify the costs long term in terms of what we wanted to try and implement. Um, and that meant if we focused on one repository, it's better than, say, focusing on one repository for research, one repository for teaching, one for images, one for research data, and so on. We also felt that if we had the content in one repository, then you're not, getting, you're not generating content silos. And one of the dilemma, dilemmas we found, we thought, was that it's, repositories are great for collecting together bodies of repository of digital content. But there's, any, lots of people have been gathering together collections of digital content ever since we've been able to do that. And too often, it's ended up with one, silos of that content having difficulty interoperating and linking to elsewhere. And that also related to that if we had one repository, it means that if we want to embed the content, embed the system, and integrate it elsewhere, then we've only got one place to interact with. We're not having to interact with, again, multiple locations. So this was our thoughts. And I should say these were our thoughts about seven years ago. They haven't changed, but this is how this is the thinking we went through when we first started looking at repositories. Um, we then came up with five principles, uh, well they've emerged over, uh, as our thinking has moved on, which is that a repository should be content agnostic, um, it shouldn't care what format of content it has, and that's just largely because again, thinking long term, new formats emerge. And we, um, I'm often struck by the fact that digital asset, commercial digital asset management systems often advertise themselves by saying, look, we manage all of these formats, and they give you a list. And to my mind, that's effectively them saying, we only manage these formats, unless you can persuade us to add an additional one further down the line. So we wanted something that could deal with anything. We also wanted the repository to be standards-based, and of course, preferably open standards-based, again, for sustainability into the future. We're not committed to saying that this, whatever software we implement, is going to be the software we're going to use for decades. We wanted it to be a piece of software where we knew we could get the content out as much as get it in. A repository should be scalable um, because we figured that the one thing that we could definitely say was that the only thing we, about, about digital content is there's going to be more of it. Um, and a repository should understand how pieces of content relate to each other. Um, and conscious of the fact that quite often when we store anything, like in a file system, we're storing a blob. And we often have blobs, lots of blobs. Now a file system uses directories as a way of organizing but the individual blobs don't actually know about each other in the computer, and on the servers. But if you can somehow structure those blobs so that they understand each other and can relate to each other, then that potentially means you can create interesting relationships. And we also figured that we're, well, not a large university, mid-sized, the repository should be manageable with limited resource. I think everyone can put their hands up when it says, uh, we only have limited resource, we need somehow to be able to manage our repository like that. Although I would say that if you're going to consider it as infrastructure, then it's, moving, it's, it's a case to be made institutionally for saying that infrastructure needs proper resources. So our thinking, and again, this is just something from our institutional perspective, led us to apply those principles and come to the conclusion that at the time, Fedora as a piece of repository software helped us to address each of those five principles. Um, some people often think about that last one and think, well, hang on. Fedora, limited or ma manageable limited resource. No, that can't be right. Fedora is a complicated piece of software compared with some of the other packages. 
And in many ways, yes, it is. But there is a very active community around it, and the way we've been able to go forward with it is by actively engaging with that community. And we've found huge benefit in doing so, and having our own turn being able to contribute back to that community in terms of developing aspects of the software. That was the Fedora Commons community, which in a sense now is being subsumed into DuraSpace, the parent body that oversees DSpace as well as Fedora. And then another community that we've helped form and create has come out uh, through the development of Hydra, which I'll now go describe in more detail. So Hydra itself is a collaborative project that kicked off in 2008 uh, between the University of Hull, the University of Virginia, Stanford University, Fedora Commons as it was at the time, and Eurospace, and shortly after a, te a technical consultancy called Media Shelf. It was an unfunded project uh, based around a common need that we'd identified, which came out of a presentation that we gave at Open Repositories in 2008 at the University of Southampton. Uh, and I would say off the back of that, that disseminating your ideas, disseminating your work at that conference um, can clearly can pay dividends. And the common need was to recognize that uh, we all wanted different repository solutions. We wanted, <coughs> we wanted flexibility to be able to deal with multiple different collections and types of content. We wanted to be able to create a reusable framework for as many multis as we could think of, multi-purpose, multi-function, multi-institutional repository-enabled solutions. And we set ourselves a three-year time frame from autumn 2008, and by the end of those three years, the three institutional partners all had uh, instances of the outcome of that project up and down, which was very satisfying uh, for all of us. And the interest we generated as we went through that and the desire to progress the project and the work that we've undertaken has meant that we've now extended that project or that relationship and engagement uh, in a, in, in indefinitely. Hydra itself is based around two pr uh, fundamental assumptions. The first one is that, and bear in mind the principles that I described earlier when thinking about these, is that no single system can provide the full range of repository space solutions for a given institution's needs. Much as we would like there to be a single system that can deal with all of this repository content, it's very difficult to conceive of how one thing can do that. At the same time, sustainable, instead of having multiple solutions, if you want sustainable solutions, you need some sort of common repository infrastructure. So that you're not having to maintain multiple systems. So it links back to that principle. Some, the second assumption, however, says that no single institution can resource the development of that infrastructure and of the full range of solutions by itself. Very difficult for anyone to any one institution to conceive of being able to do that by itself. Um, therefore, of course, the default situation is that we get hold of a generic solution and we try and bend it to meet our needs. But I think, as many people may recognize, we all want to try and tailor the system to meet our individual needs because our needs are institutional, they vary ever so slightly, we want to be able to try and sort of tweak things. So how can we provide something, get together to provide something which is common infrastructure, but which allows us to develop our own variant, our own implementation based on that common infrastructure? So just to sort of link back Hydra to Fedora, because I've sort of made the jump without really explaining it. One of the reasons Hydra came about is that Fedora can be complex. And the reason it can be complex is because it's an incredibly flexible system. And as soon as you start introducing high levels of flexibility into any system, they start becoming more complicated in order to try and get your head around how you deal with that, flex that flexibility. So what Hydra was about was about saying, well, how can you take that flexibility and provide some sort of framework which allows you to take advantage of it, but using simpler, lightweight tools? rather than having to deal with the heavyweight tools that Fedora comes with by default. So all of the partners of the Hydra project are Fedora users. We are working with that technology. But when we set out, we thought, well, this is a problem set which is not necessarily unique to Fedora and could be applied in other, in other repository technical environments. So the principles of what we've come out with in Hydra, what the Hydra project has produced, could be applied in other repository environments and other repositories. 
Um, we've progressed it technically using Fedora because that's what we, can, we happen to work with at the moment. And the name Hydra, we develop Hydra heads. Hydra was de chosen deliberately to represent the fact that we're looking to create a repository which is a single body of content but which has multiple points of access to it, each of which may provide different types of functionality, different types of interaction. Hydra heads. And taken from the website, we now define Hydra in four different ways. Um, Hydra is a repository solution. It is a piece of software. You can download it. You can work with it. Um, and it can be adapted to make, and it is a piece of infrastructure. You can uh, then adapt it and develop Hydra heads to meet your specific needs. And we have a variety of different um, heads dotted around different institutions that are currently in production. But very much behind that, Hydra is a community. This, I mean, we take the bottom one, actually. Hydra is open source software. I mean, yes, it's free, like so many other repository systems. You can download it. You can just run with it. It's, it there's no cost up front, cost of running. Um, but very much infusing what we're doing within Hydra is Hydra is about trying to identify, build a community which identifies repository solutions that are required and then seeks to work together to try and address, identify solutions to those needs that have emerged out of the, the, need, the different digital content management needs that there are. Um, so uh, we have regular meetings, we meet up at conferences, we meet face to face, we have regular Skypes, we have very active communication between us all in order to make sure that uh, we have a common idea and principle. We, we're continuing the, the common themes that we have established as we've gone through the initial project and developing them for and then lastly, just to highlight that Hydra is a technical framework, so although it is a solution you can download, you can use with it, it is something you can also bend, you can adapt it, you can build other uh, solutions with it, um, whatever you prefer to do. Um, so just to highlight that partnerships aspect, um, we've always wanted to enable mm -hmm. others to join that partnership, that community, uh, as and when they wished. We started off with uh, those five uh, partners which I mentioned at the beginning there. We now have ten, um, and there are two others in, currently in process. Uh, and when I say partners, um, it's loose affiliation. It's not a sort of membership in any sense. We do have an MOU which lays out the principles of what it means to be a partner, which is essentially saying, please contribute to what uh, you're joining and be an active part member of that partnership. Uh, but other than that, it's uh, very lightweight. Um, but we also are establishing, in a sense, a semi-legal basis for Hydra as a community, simply so that we can establish some structures around it, main means of operation, and looking to the future. In December, we have a meeting which is going to be very much looking strategically at what we do in the next three to five years uh, on how we develop the community and also then facilitate the development of other repository solutions going forward. And as much as those assumptions earlier, the principle, the, the nice proverb that popped up that seemed to describe what Hydra is about is that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. I think many people involved in other communities would reflect on that and uh, agree that uh, it's a very, very powerful statement. So just to highlight a bit more about the community model, we have a steering group at the top which is made up of the original partners. Um, and then we also have a very active Hydra developers uh, group who uh, have regular communication between themselves across institutions uh, about taking the software forward. And we have also then the extended group of Hydra partners who again uh, get together via Skype on a monthly basis to uh, just sort of come up with ideas, suggestions, and uh, communication about how different developments are taking place so that we can learn from each other's best practice and experience. Um, to talk about the technology, I mean the, the implementation as it stands, although I should say of course then that uh, you could actually implement this in different ways, is that we are all for more users as it currently stands. Uh, we use Solar, uh, which is very much the indexing tool of choice uh, for generating the uh, index uh, to search. 
um, but very, very powerful. And that was also used by another piece of software which we've incorporated into Hydra called Blacklight, uh, which was designed at the University of Virginia as a next generation library catalog interface. Um, uh, in much the same way that all of the library management systems now provide next generation interfaces like Primo, like um, there are others. Um, this was their, their take on it. Uh, Stanford and Johns Hopkins particularly have taken over the reins of developing it. Again, it's open source. Um, but the key thing about it was that it, although it was designed for catalog records, art catalog records, it can actually be applied to any XML format and can surface any type of XML record, including whatever you have down in your repository. So we decided to take that as our primary interface. Um, and we've sort of implemented that as we've gone along. Keeping, trying to keep things together, we've actually just launched a next generation library catalog interface at Hull using Blacklight as well. So that in a sense is stand, uh, in parallel. And underpinning this is that a lot of the work that is within Hydra and Blacklight itself are all based on Ruby as a technical framework, as a technical language. Um, and the Ruby community has this delightful idea of developing Ruby gems in the same way that I believe in the Python community they have eggs. So it's a matter of how you modularize your code. But they have Ruby gems and Hydra is essentially a combination of different gems which work together to provide a lot of the functionality around the different solutions that can be developed. Um, just to say, well, just, just quickly about Ruby. I mean, I know a lot of people look at Ruby and think, oh, no, no Ruby experience. None of the Hydra partners had any Ruby experience when we started this. And all of them learned it within six months. And they're running production systems with it very easily. So um, it's been quite remarkable at how quickly they've been able to take it on board and get up and running with it. Um, four key capabilities that come with Hydra, which are informed by Blacklight, but built out with um, Hydra generally, is that it can support any kind of record or metadata. So, we, by default, we work with mods, but there are other people working with uh, VRA, PB Core, uh, Dublin Core, uh, a variety of different metadata formats, uh, depending on what you want to use for the type of records that you're using. Um, oh, and also EAD, people are using it for archive. Um, you can have object specific behaviors. So if you happen to have a book, a record that is a book or a book chapter, you can say, right, the create templates, I will create this and it will have a specific template specific to the book. Or I can even choose to display it in different ways. Uh, so if it, the system recognizes it's a book, it will display the record in a way that's appropriate to a book. So yeah, tailored views. Um, and, but the key to this is that you should, it's easy to override the basic the system and you can put in place your own local uh, modifications. But that doesn't get in the way of future upgrades. <laughs> Think about local modifications. And I'll just show you, uh, come to an example of how that different displays uh, can be beneficial. Um, so what implementing Hydra at the University of Hull has allowed us to address a wide, fairly wide range of pieces of content. So we are working with research outputs, not as heavily as many have been up till now, but we are getting more into it and we're going to be receiving them from our Chris system in the way that a number of repositories are integrated with their Chris systems. Uh, we have some learning materials working with research data, uh, archiving event outputs for students. We do the theses and demonstrate dissertations, exam papers, and uh, trying to build up a student our handbook archive. And I suppose key to part of those uh, collections is that we have Hydra comes with granular security. So you can have some items and some collections which are only in-house, or even if you have the proper identity management down to the department, or you can be open. So you can vary it according to what you'd like to have. Um, okay. um, and just sort of highlight some of the things we've been able to use it for. Uh, we did a little project last year which tried to in integrate the whole system with open journal systems so that we could enable the archiving of publications that were being put together uh, using that, um, um, we'd like to be very interested in trying to de develop that further. Um, we are, as I think, a bit tiptoeing into data management. I think everyone's trying to tiptoe carefully into data management. Uh, we were very fortunate to have a project earlier this year which got us up and running with the Charmed History. 
Um, and then that's helped uh, us take a lead on developing the EPSRC roadmap um, and uh, is trying to build up data management as a capability within the University of Hull generally. Uh, just to show two of the views earlier, it's on the left hand side here we have a record which is a journal article and by virtue of knowing it's a journal article we can have the bulk of the bibliographic record there but we've separated out the publication information so that it's very clear what that is and we can find relevant links but in the same repository we have a data set which has very different metadata um, and we've also managed to embed some uh, Google Maps geocode in it so we can display aspects that data set relevant to it. Um, oh, I suppose the other thing to highlight there is that uh, that's a record with one article. This one has multiple files attached to it. Um, I, I know lots of other systems can do that as well. Uh, nice to be able to do it flexibly. Um, and the way we organize the content is that on the left-hand side is an example of how we structure it. So I mean, every repository in a sense has its way of structuring things. And quite often the hierarchical, like um, DSpaces, communities, and collections of communities, and so on and so on. So we have that in the background. And then for you, for display, however, we have a concept of display sets, which effectively means we can actually sort of go to these all structural sets we can say, right, I'll have something from there, something from there, two items from there, or maybe one from up there, and we can then group them together into a collection and display that on a flexible basis. One of the ideas for that organizational capability came about because of our work with our archives colleagues. Um, in tandem with the Hydra project, they got involved in, with the same partners in a Mellon Funder project called AIMS. Uh, which is an, in, an inter-institutional uh, inter model for stewardship of born digital collections, which was about recognizing that archives don't necessarily just get given boxes of papers, they get given hard disks, and they have to somehow deal with those hard disks and all the content on them. Um, and this was a project trying to understand and establish a model for how you actually dealt with all of that. And that helped greatly inform a lot of the flexibility that's now inherent within Hydra. Um, just a quick thought on Finch outcomes, which I've been thinking about myself, and it's related to what the other thing says. It's one of the takes I took on this, which sort of related to how we were thinking about our repository, is that notwithstanding whatever you thought about repositories and the role that Finch gave them, it did highlight the valuable role they could play in providing supporting infrastructure. There's that word again, infrastructure. But also underpinning that research dissemination. And then sort of talked about how you could deal with grey literature. I suppose maybe something that surprises me is how infrequently you hear the discussion around grey literature when it comes to digital content and repositories. Um, Theses, dissertations, of course, establishing links between research data and publications, and then highlighted the preservation capability. Um, certainly, to my mind, Finch looked like an opportunity as much as anything else for establishing a repository. Maybe not in the way that we might have envisaged they could be established, although that's still an open argument in debate, but in many other ways as well. So, just in summary then, our repository is still a work in progress. I think it always will be. The nature of digital content collections is uh, so, so much in flux. Uh, but it is gradually maturing. And what we've set out to be able to do, which was to apply it to any type of content we've been able to do, been able to apply it to a range of purposes. Um, and I'll go back to that initial thought, which is that we see that the reposit an institutional repository is a repository for the institution as a whole. And Hydra has certainly enabled us to do that. Thank you. Um, just to highlight two things, there's a Project Hydra website which contains all the information you probably want to know about the work and the community. And just to highlight, we have our first Hydra UK event at the LSC in two weeks' time. Thank you. Yeah. That would be time for a few. Couple of questions. Couple of questions. Yeah. I just wanted to ask you, that's, I've been meaning to look at Hyper 80 because I really relate to some of the issues from my own experience that you're trying to tackle. Um, it's a rhetorical question, really, but I suppose, I mean, and I appreciate it's really difficult to answer, but could you give me perhaps a ballpark idea of a learning stroke development curve if I wanted to implement Fedora? You know, what sort of resources I'd need, human resources, and that kind of thing? Um, I'll describe our own situation. 
know the easiest way of doing that, is that um, we do, I mean, we, when we first started looking at repositories a few years ago, we were fortunate to get uh, just funding which allowed us to take on and develop a for those projects. And we were then fortunate to find them a permanent role, albeit a permanent role as a generic developer in ICT. So he is able to dedicate some of his time to the repository. And um, I, I suppose his, his contribution at the time amounts to about a half time development capable activity, which I know is still a lot more than most people have access to. And I would say that if you're going to get into Fedora, if you're going to get into um, Hydra, then the, a level of technical resource is required. I'm not going to shy away from that. But then the, the variety of different use cases, the variety of needs around managing different types of digital content, if that's the route you want to go down, to my mind, would, requires that anyway. Um, and I, it's worth, I think it's worth pursuing the case for that as in terms of making a repository a piece of infrastructure. Aside of the technical resource, um, I mean, I act as a sort of tech, uh, repository manager and owner, service owner. Um, and then we've had, I've, we've, our catalogers do, the existing catalogers dedicate some of their time to cataloging. And um, we have what a project funded project manager who contributes about 0.2 of his time to. Are, are people joining the community now um, on the vote? on a rolling basis. The hydro. Yes, I mean, uh, someone, I didn't include it actually, the colleague of mine at Stanford, he has this graph that shows a sort of continual climb. So I mean, this time last year we had six, seven partners. Uh, we've now got 10. There'll be two more by the end of this year, so we'll be up to 12. Um, I think the aim was to try and get 20 by OR30. And given the length and amount of interest, uh, it's not beyond the right possibility. And that's, that's international, so I mean, all right, so we've been fortunate enough to work with US partners. That's great. We like doing that. Um, but thankfully, it's getting a bit more international now. So I mean, there's a lot of interest in Denmark, a lot of interest in Ireland. Dublin seems to be a hotbed of repository activity as well as I can make out. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's, it's, it's nice to have that level of interest, um, just more generic. Thank you.